All right. Great. All right, hi everyone. My name is Chanel Hasen. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. We are so thrilled to have you here today. Um, we have an exciting presentation tonight on Pacific Northwest River otters, their habitat, ecology, and health, featuring Dr. Heidi Island. And um, so I know a lot of people often mistake river otters for sea otters off of the Oregon coast, which we found it important to have a presentation all about these other furry friends. Um, and so Heidi will touch upon how rescued captive river otters are informing the ecological and physiological wellness of native otter populations in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm going to give a little overview about the Alaka Alliance and who we are. So sea otters were once very plentiful along the entire west coastline, um, Mexico up to Alaska and all the way around to Japan. But there's currently an 800 mile gap from Northern Washington to Northern California where sea otters are nowhere to be found. So that's not a good thing. Um, but we know for at least 10,000 years, sea otters were an important part of the culture of the people along the Oregon coastline. And as you can see here, there's at least six different names for sea otters from various Oregon coastal tribes. So how the Alaka Alliance came to be was David Hatch, the late David Hatch. Uh, he was a tribal, so let's tribal coup, sorry, let me start over there. A Siletz tribal member of the Ku, Sayus Law, and Aleut descent, and he was searching for an indigenous name for a dinghy he was creating in his living room with his son, Peter. And he came across a, a word, alaka, in a Chinook jargon dictionary, which means sea otter. And so that chance find led him down a pathway of activism and to raise awareness to everyday Oregonians and scientists alike about the extirpation of sea otters from Oregon, their key ecological role, and the possibility of how we can get them to return to our coastline. So our mission if you can't already tell, is to restore a healthy population of sea otters to the Oregon coast and in the process, help make Oregon's marine ecosystems more robust and resilient. So I've got um, some otterly exciting news for you all. Uh, our feasibility study that we've been working on with several researchers from North America are, is going to be live on our website Fingers crossed, August 30th is the date if everything goes according to plan. So that will be open for public comment and review. So it's just generalizing the pros and cons of a sea otter translocation and release here in Oregon. Uh, we have a Maris Otter Challenge coming up this winter. So it's actually a beer challenge. There's a malt called Maris Otter. And so we've got at least seven breweries signed up across the entire state of Oregon from Central Oregon, Portland to the coast that are participating. Um, so stay tuned for that for the winter. And then we have our Sea Otter Symposium, which is again, uh, like last year, virtually taking place uh, October 5th through the 7th. And so what we're highlighting during this symposium is basically all the findings from our feasibility study from all the researchers uh, that put in their comments and research on that. So uh, stay tuned, we'll open a registration very soon for that. And uh, since I am the communications person, I'm going to plug in all our social media channels uh, and be sure to check out our website if you haven't already. It's just full of information. If you have any questions about sea otters or kelp forest or the tribal um, connections to sea otters, please visit our website. And if you don't already, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all our webinars right now are um, up on the next day on YouTube. So. Um, hello, if you're watching this from YouTube in the future. 
All right, so next up we have Heidi Island. She's a professor of comparative animal behavior and neuroscience at Pacific University in Oregon and a se senior research associate for the Oregon Zoo. She is the principal investigator in a four year long longitudinal study of the Whidbey Islands North American River otters and she will have much more to say on that. So I will pass it over to you, Heidi. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Oh, also while she's getting that set up, I always forget to say this, but make sure if you have any questions during Heidi's presentation, uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature on Zoom, or you can enter your question in the chat if that's easiest for you, and we'll get to it after the presentation. Go for it. Great, is this um, in focus? Yes, it looks great. Super. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really honored to be a speaker for the Alaka Alliance. I, I really support the mission. I'm um, also incredibly pleased and impressed um, for their commitment in the collaboration of Indigenous cultures in conservation, um, and it's incredibly important. And so uh, I'm really grateful to be able to be involved with this uh, organization today. Um, before I get moving, I want to give a quick shout out to a few folks that have been oops, actively involved in, in um, supporting my work. Um, the Oregon Zoo would be Camino Land Trust and Water Stewards Pacific, Pacific Identifications, um, and Washington State Parks in particular. I am a comparative psychologist, and when I say that, my uh, the reaction I most often get is kind of a head scratch. Um, I thought you worked with otters. How is it that you're a psychologist? And this is because most of the time, this is what we, people think um, when they think of psychologists. But uh, psychology is really the empirical study of behavior as it relates to um, the physical, cognitive, and emotional um, individual. And so there are actually 51 different disciplines within psychology. I study um, comparative species behavior as it relates to their physical, cognitive, and emotional well-being. Um, and what that really translates to is behavioral biology. And so um, when we look at the physical component, it involves reproduction, predation, injuries, um, endocrinology. The cognitive component is choice. Um, often game theory is involved in this, your choice behavior, how the environment influences choice. Um, learning and memory, problem solving, all is part of the cognitive component. And then the emotional component is what people most traditionally think of relative to psychology, which is on attachments, um, anxiety and boredom or anything um, psychogenic, uh, your volition, how motivated you are, your willingness or your perception of a locus of control. And then um, in the case of, of non-human animals, vocalizations, they can't communicate verbally um, with us in a way that we understand through language, but vocalizations is still a form of communication. That communication is an important part of the emotional component of the organism. And um, in psychology, really these two parts, the cognitive and the emotional are what we're most interested in, particularly as it relates to non-human animals. Um, although as you, likely know you can't really understand cognitive and emotional well-being if you don't understand the physical well-being of um, an organism. And so we don't get to dispatch the physical component, particularly in, in um, uh, comparative uh, psychology or behavioral biology. I'm interested in otters, my comparative population, even though my research area is in animal wellness, my population are, are otters. Um, specifically in Oregon, they would be the North American river otter. In Washington, it's the North American river otter and Northern sea otter. California um, is replaced the Northern sea otter with Southern sea otter. So of the 13 global otter species, my research interest is in two, um, specifically uh, the sea otter and and the North American river otter. My work though has largely been in a captive environment with Southern sea otters. I haven't done Northern sea otter research even though my field area is in Washington. 
Um, just a little quick background on the difference between the two and some quick and dirty tips on how to tell the difference between a sea otter and a river otter. First of all, sea otters, as all of you know, are aquatic and they're also endangered. Their size is different than river otters. They are sexually dimorphic, meaning you see a, a much bigger difference between males and females in size. And um, there is some difference relative to Northern and Southern sea otters as well. Northern sea otters are slightly larger um, than Southern sea otters. Uh, and Northern sea otters include um, uh, otters from Alaska and Washington. In fact, the Washington stock is from um, and Chipka, Alaska, uh, they were reintroduced in 1969 and 1970 from 59 animals, um, which dwindled down to between 10 and 40 animals. They, don't, they didn't have a clear count, but um, the current population of the sea otters in Washington is just under 2,000. Um, in uh, uh, Washington, you're looking at sea otters at within 130 kilometer range from Point Grenville to La Push along the Olympics. Um, their habitat, their 90, over 90% 90 of their time is spent in the aquatic environment. They are typically belly up, although frequently you'll see them roll around as they wrap in kelp or they dive down and come back up with their, um, with their uh, forage. Um, their pelage, which is their dense fur, um, the densest fur of any mammal, it's 140,000 hairs per centimeter squared. Uh, compare this to 57,000 hairs per centimeter squared for river otters. To give you an idea of that, we have 300 um, per centimeter squared. Or if we talk about the whole head, about 100,000 total. Um, for some of us, there may be more, particularly depending on where you are in your life cycle. but um, that's about the, the difference. Um, the feet for uh, sea otters are flippered hind feet. Um, there are four clawed feet um, with glands on the hind feet for river otter. In fact, much of what I look at is otter sign um, in the field, which is because otters, uh, river otters will um, scratch and um, dig, particularly with our hind feet to leave a scent. Um, so scent marking is particularly important for communication. Um, offspring for sea otter is typically one animal per female. Um, offspring for river otter can be anywhere from one to six, although two to three is most typical. Um, sexual maturity for river otters is around two to three years. Um, for, for sea otters, it's three to five for females with five to seven roughly for males. So um, you can see part of of the reproductive difference um, in sea otters and river otters and why uh, these guys are endangered and these are a least concerned animal relative to the um, red list. Um, if you look at the profile of sea otters, again, they are almost always belly up as you're observing them in the field. With river otters, they have kind of a serpentine quality. In fact, one of the behavioral um, categories that we have for river otters and activity budgets is called Nessie, which is what you're seeing here. They look sort of Loch Ness-ish in profile. They're almost always belly down unless they come up with food as well. But even then, they'll eat it on the fly as they're belly down traveling. Usually, they'll look even like a log. You can frequently confuse them for a snag or a piece of bulk help. They just travel a lot faster. Um, also, uh, relative to both animals, not a lot of body fat. In fact, for river otters, very, very little. The bulk of any adipose tissue is towards the tail. And so um, they don't spend an enormous amount of time in the water, uh, significantly less, less than 30%. Um, and this is because uh, they get hypothermia relatively quickly. You'll, sp you'll see them um, in the water typically no more than 20 to 30 minutes for a foraging bout. They'll do this throughout the day. They are um, referred to as river otter, but it's really a mislabeling of, of where they're found. They are in all types of water. Um, otter is from Old English meaning water creature, and it's too bad we didn't call river otters water creature otters or something along that line because they, um, along marine areas, they spend an enormous amount of time in coastal foraging. 
And virtually all of the field work that I do um, is along coastal habitat, although there are some lakes and ponds on Whidbey Island as well. So um, I mentioned, uh, and uh, Chanel mentioned that I'm a senior research associate at the Oregon Zoo, which is captive population. Um, and so why would I study captive animals if I'm, if I'm doing field work? And the reason for this is that zoos have become increasingly important um, in conservation, rescue, and rehabilitation. It used to be at one time that uh, the Victorian era of zoos where it was for entertainment status and prestige has really gone away. And um, as we've become more literate and more uh, worldly in understanding other species and also with climate change, um, the massive extinction wave that we're currently experiencing. Zoological gardens are going to be increasingly important and it's going to be increasingly important that we're socially responsible as well as um, responsible uh, from a conservation perspective. Um, and so if, you're, if your interest is in rehabilitation, um, and that's not possible, then what you have left are animals that are serving as educational ambassadors. That is animals who have been rescued, but cannot be rehabilitated because they are not fit for, for a wild environment, or they're unable to be um, uh, relocated. And so this allows them to serve as an educational ambassador, but if their behavior is inconsistent with native conspecifics, that is other species like them in a natural habitat, then they're poor ambassadors. And that makes us also poor custodians. And so we really need to understand um, across species, what is um, a good ambassador for captive um, rearing or captive rehabilitation what animals are a good fit for uh, constrained living or captivity, which are really poor. Um, you might imagine that those animals that have really broad territorial ranges are not generally a good fit for captivity, but some are. Um, river otters are quirky because depending on whether they're riparian um, or they're uh, coastal foraging, their range it, it differs. If you're a marine foraging river otter, you generally keep a really tight range, no more than about five kilometers. But if you're riparian, it can be upwards of a hundred kilometers. So the range really differs. And so this makes them kind of a question mark about whether or not um, this is an ideal candidate for um, captive environments um, and rehabilitation. And so that's part of what we've been interested in. Um, captivity, uh, you have really just experienced a simulation of captivity couldn't have been better served than this last year. COVID-19 and our shelter in place experience was constrained space, just like you might see at a zoo or aquarium. There are limited opportunities to engage in natural behavior. People were stuck inside. There was limited social engagement. People weren't able to see the people that they normally saw. There was limited or no lo locus of control, which is a psychology term, meaning that you didn't have agency. You couldn't um, change what was happening in your environment. And that loss of, of control is really difficult for all organisms. And so the consequences of this are anxiety or boredom. Um, anxiety emerges from either overstimulation or understimulation. And understimulation is still anxiety. It's manifested as what we refer to as boredom, but it's still a form of anxiety. Um, we also experience depression um, and anhedonia, which is just sort of lack of motivation or a lack of enjoying anything that we used to enjoy. And if you look at this relative to captive animals, it matches, it matches perfectly. And so um, if you're a person who travels the world and you were stuck uh, at your house, you might have experienced an even worse uh, series of of wellness factors than someone who didn't travel very much or who was more of a homebody. Um, this is true for, for animals as well. And so um, this was one of those uh, uh, sort of natural experiments that humans were involved in or participated in that really mimicked um, what captivity can be like for non-human animals. Um, I do research at the Oregon Zoo. Um, these are my research subjects, the Southern Sea Otters. They are all rescues 
from uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium through their surrogacy program. Um, the, this guy is um, Eddie. Eddie is deceased, but he was the oldest documented sea otter. He's 21 years of age when he died. You probably have seen all kinds of videos of him. Um, the Oregon Zoo, particularly Jen Jenny De Groot, um, had incredibly creative keeper um, uh, enrichment for his physical therapy. He had arthritis in his elbow and the way that they um, exercised him was to teach him how to shoot hoops. And uh, in doing that, it allowed him to um, actually get some exercise in that elbow. He, his uh, reproductive partner initially at one time um, was Thelma, uh, this otter here. She also has passed away. She passed away um, in 2019. Um, and her uh, fostered um, otter was Juno. Juno is here as well. Juno is still part of the exhibit, um, as is Lincoln, who's male, and Uni Sushi. My work with um, the sea otters was largely looking at um, uh, foster care and uh, essentially um, the allo parenting that Thelma and Juno were uh, a part of. And um, Juno engaged in an unusual behavior where she uh, in, uh, did pseudo suckling. So Thelma was not lactating, um, she was on birth control. And yet, uh, because Juno was so young when she was introduced to the enclosure, um, she was still sort of interested in nursing and began pseudo suckling. Um, what was, what's interesting about both the um, sea otters and the river otters at the Oregon Zoo is they're all rescues that could not be rehabilitated. But what that means is that they are wild born. And so their behavior um, should reasonably match um, natural behavior because they haven't learned <clears throat> any bad habits um, from being born in a captive environment. And so this really allows us to model what happens if you're looking at an animal who is wild born, their behavior is consistent with instinctive behavior, and then they're um, introduced into a captive environment. Um, how does that differ from field uh, native um, conspecifics? And so um, this is Juno now, she has the adult collage of the white head with uni sushi, and she's still engaging in that pseudo suckling behavior. This is one of those things that you might keep an eye on if you're doing research um, in looking at um, anxiety with otters. Now, does this mean this is a bad thing? No, it doesn't. We engage in all kinds of these sort of atypical behaviors that are referred to as fidgeting. In fact, I'm doing it right now. I have a pen in my hand and I'm sort of clicking the lid on and off. Um, also, we, you know, chew our cheek, we twiddle our thumbs, but children thumb suck. There's all kinds of fidgeting behavior. It doesn't necessarily mean that this person is exceedingly anxious. It might mean that they have extra energy. And um, for those of us who drink caffeine, uh, fidgeting is really typical if you're over caffeinated. Um, so it's just one of an entire array of things that we can look at um, for a, a marker of wellness. Um, for the North American river otters, uh, BC buttercup uh, was male and um, was one of the otters that I observe um, and researched as well as Tilly. This is Tilly and BC here. Tilly is still around. Tilly um, and BC have uh, parented or been parents four separate times um, and also foster parented. And my interest again was still looking at the role of parenting in as a biologically relevant behavior as part of enrichment for animals in a captive environment. And part of the reason for looking at this is because um, part of that goal of being socially responsible relative to captive conditions is, is it appropriate to breed in a captive environment? Um, and so one of the things that you look at is, well, what happens among those animals that don't have an opportunity to parent versus those that do? And what about biological parenting versus fostering? And the beauty of um, the North American River Otter Project um, is that uh, they, they both had biological offspring and uh, fostered offspring. So 
Um, they successfully rescued, rehabilitated, bred several generations of North American river otter. And so the question became, are North American river otter, I refer to them as narrow, a good model for rescued or captive programs? And um, how do we determine wellness in a captive population? Stereotypy is one way. I talked about that before, that fidgeting. Um, we don't use the term stereotypy as much anymore. It's sort of a broader category of behaviors. Now we really refer to it as abnormal repetitive behavior, which is just another way of saying fidgeting. Um, also socialization, are they socializing? Um, do they have meaningful attachments with conspecifics or even those from other species within their enclosures? What are their endocrine markers? Cortisol is an important endocrine marker for stress and anxiety. And so we use that as a marker as well. And they, then do the organ zoo narrow engage in ARBs? And we know that they do. Um, even BC and Tilly, who uh, have a lot of space, they have over 200 different enrichment. Oregon Zoo has been, I am not an employee of the Oregon Zoo. I've been fortunate in that they've allowed me to do my research there, but I, I can talk about um, uh, how impressive their enrichment is without having a conflict of interest truly really, as an outside party. Um, and they've done a great job. Uh, but even with that, there's still times in which you may see more of um, sort of these fidgeting or abnormal repetitive um, movements. You may think of it with um, canines, particularly wolves, where they do pacing behavior back and forth with primates. It may be over grooming, sometimes rocking behavior. Um, with the river otters, they pace in, in the water. So they don't land pace, the water pace. And with that, they have a sequence of um, other behaviors that they engaged in too, particularly Tilly. Um, these are both pictures of Tilly. She would um, sort of pace across her enclosure in the water, um, do a series of spins and sometimes stick her foot in her mouth, even though there was nothing uh, physically wrong with her feet. Um, and she also would stick her feet in her mouth um, in the den. Now, do we think of this as abnormal repetitive behavior? No more than you would think of thumb sucking in that way. It's a, it, it may be a self-soothing behavior. But what we noticed is that um, significantly so, this dropped off when they were parenting. Um, and this could be because they didn't have time to engage in fidgeting while they're parenting. Um, but no matter what, this means that um, they're engaging in more biologically typical behaviors. These ARBs you don't see in field behavior. You don't see that in a native habitat or in wild populations. Um, aside from we don't know necessarily to look in a den to see if they're foot sucking. I suspect that might be something that they would do, um, but I don't have any evidence for that. So they also uh, reduce their ARBs when they foster. And so fostering, it didn't even need to be biological offspring, it could be fostered offspring. And so this is sort of the foundation for going into the field. Here's what we know relative to our captive animals. Um, this launched an eight year comparative study of um, North American river otters uh, on Whidbey Island. And I'll explain why Whidbey in a second. Um, the fourth question that comes from this then is how do the Oregon Zoo captive narrow uh, glucocorticoids compare to wild healthy populations? So marine foraging um, North American river otter on Whidbey Island. The North American river otter, the three uh, that are currently at the zoo all came from Oregon. So they are all orphans that were found in the state with the exception of BC who is deceased. Um, all of the narrow have been from, from Oregon. Um, so from this, as I mentioned before, where we look at behavior as cognition and emotion and physical, we don't know, or we didn't know at the time, um, enough about the physical population of the river otters on Whidbey Island. So we had to, uh, we had to do some addi uh, additional work. What is their principal diet? Diet is an important part of endocrine function. In fact, um, fats are the precursor for steroid hormones. So if you do not have adequate fat, even our river otters that have very little, it can limit um, steroid hormone production. It's why today um, 
body mass index has increased significantly, but yet the age of menarche in young girls has gone down significantly by several years. The average age of girls who reach menarche is 10 years of age. It used to be 13, 10 years ago. And this uh, correlates with the increase in body fat composition. Why? We have, we have more fat, thereby um, that fat can be broken down into steroid hormones earlier. So we need to know about diet if we're going to look at uh, behavioral endocrinology. We also want to know how the diet changes across seasons, what's the availability of the food that they're eating relative to season, relative to tides, also perhaps relative to um, current. Um, narrow delay implantation, as do sea otters. This means that the breeding season can vary by population. Um, so we needed to know when Whidbey Island's breeding and pupping seasons were. We needed to know what the population distribution and density was. Um, and uh, we needed to fully understand um, uh, uh, what the behavioral genetics were for the animals. And that project is actually still underway. This is an eight year study. So we have um, of this three of the, of the questions that I um, just posed are in review, um, but the rest are still underway. So why North American river otters? Why are they important? River otters are an edge species, and therefore they're often among the first to disappear from polluted areas. Edge species are those that occupy ecotones. They go from freshwater to terrestrial environments to marine ecosystems, and this can be all within 100 yards of one another. In fact, the species that I look at on Whidbey Island, there is a lake, um, a little peninsula of land, a strip of land, and then um, a bay, all within essentially a football field of one another. So um, because they're ed edge species, they're often also the first to disappear from polluted areas. They go from one area to the other, um, pulling from all of the persistent organic pollutants um, uh, from, from one, one area to the next. Um, <clears throat> Despite this, they're still a least concerned species, which means in terms of study, it makes it much easier. There's less uh, uh, permitting that's required. And it, we're catching them before they become a threatened species or an endangered species. So they're kind of an ideal candidate. Um, these are four animals that I salvaged in the last year. Um, this is a pup that died of idiopathic causes. I don't know why um, the pup uh, died. It was in such a profound state of decomposition. There really wasn't any necropsy or anything that could be done. Um, what you're really seeing here is just pelage. And after about an hour uh, post-mortem, the fur, the pelage begins to lift from the skin. And so um, even the hair sampling can't really be done when they're that decomposed. So this is an idiopathic um, cause of death. This otter died from interspecies competition. Likely it was along a heavily territorial area. It had slashes, mouth bites along the neck and the back, which are typical for otter bites. Um, this female uh, suffered a gunshot wound. Um, I, I actually was called and managed to salvage her within probably three or four hours following um, her uh, injury. Uh, lots of people perceive of river otters as a pest because they can den under decks. They sometimes get on people's boats. They can make a mess. Um, although it's really transient, they don't typically stay there. So they may make a lot of noise during breeding season where they sound like fighting cats or raccoons. Um, they may uh, forage and bring their food and have some of their leavings um, in residential areas, but generally they leave. Um, they don't stay for long periods of time, so this is really unfortunate. This particular otter um, was the victim of a car accident, and um, I was also able to salvage this one uh, within the same day that that had happened. So um, of the four otters in the last year, one is unknown, one is from interspecies competition, one is from a gunshot, and one is from an automotive accident. And if we look at that relative to Joe Gato's research out of the San Juans, he had a 10-year um, study of opportunistic salvage 
among 30 animals and over 47% were the result of um, uh, an accident, some vehicular, um, uh, some from bicycles, a variety of other uh, causes, but most all of them having to do, again, similar to mine, where over half were the result of human or anthropogenic cause. Um, another reason that we choose uh, NARO is that they support interspecies competitors. They are seasonally territorial. They keep latrines. They have high latrine fidelity. They use that for scent marking. Um, and as they uh, eat, they, um, particularly would-be otters, they like sculpin and flatfish, which often have spines. And so they'll start at the belly, they'll eat to the tail, and they'll leave the head. Here you can see a heron has um, opportunistically grabbed the leavings from the otters. Uh, I, I think this is a staghorn sculpin here. And so he, he's just bolting down hole the part that has all the prickly parts. Same here for the eagle. They're also apex predators with pretty adaptable diets. But apex predators uh, is important. Why that would matter is because um, if you're interested in persistent organic pollutants or the effects of antibiotics in the water, they have a bioaccumulative effect. And so if you're in an environment that is exposed to persistent organic pollutants, um, the plankton are affected by that. And the fish that eat the plankton are affected by, by that as well as um, from the plankton load. Um, the small fish are eaten by larger fish. So they get the plankton, the small fish, as well as their own exposure. Then you have predators eating the smaller fish or the larger fish. And it's sort of that um, the lady who ate the fly and that, that whole scenario. So um, that bioaccumulation where essentially those POPs um, are having to be filtered both through the hepatic and renal system uh, of, of otters. And so rather than it docking in the lipids, it goes straight to the liver um, and affects liver enzymes. And so again, part of that indicator species issue relative to otters. They're also involved in the transfer of marine derived nitrogen to the terrestrial ecosystem. So as they're eating all of um, these marine organisms, they transfer that in the form of nitrogen to the terrestrial ecosystem. And it actually helps make a more diverse, biodiverse um, uh, population of microorganisms. They're also non-migratory, uh, but active across 24 hours. This doesn't mean they don't sleep. It means that they take a series of naps. They're referred to as crepuscular. They're most active at dawn and dusk. Although you may see them at any given time because they're not nocturnal or diurnal, they keep a 24 hour uh, schedule. And so, um, I am a professor at Pacific University. I live in McMinnville, Oregon. Why am I in Washington and not Oregon? And the short answer uh, to this is that there are 1,400 um, uh, uh, areas essentially for rivers of the 55 rivers in Oregon, 1,400 miles of river um, with 55 rivers, um, somewhere in the order of like, 300 plus uh, square miles of coastal uh, habitat, whereas Whidbey Island is about 40 miles from one end to the other with 200 square miles over the whole island with a series of about eight lakes. Um, so of our uh, uh, difference relative to just it being easier. It's significantly easier to do a study in a locked ecosystem. That is, given that this is all marine habitat here, sorry, I, I think I said 1400 rivers, 1400 named lakes in Oregon um, with 55 uh, rivers across the state. In um, Whidbey, you just don't have nearly that, that um, distance. It's not nearly as difficult um, to monitor. And when I talk a little bit about their den sites and their latrines, they're all over the island. So it makes it really easy um, in terms of keeping track of different populations and monitoring ter uh, territorial areas where they have high fidelity. So um, also given this, we're able to see some cool stuff. 
These are uh, river otters mating. They're, they generally do this in the water, although poor play can happen on land, often in people's backyards or under their decks. But these are two river otters mating. Um, this is not an uncommon sight in uh, Island County. Um, and this is a locked healthy population of otters. This is all the different observed and reported latrines in Island County since I started doing this research in 2018. Just this little area here along Admiralty Bay has all of these different den sites. These are within a three mile area. So really easy to keep track of all of these different populations. And this is probably three different populations. Um, and the way that we know this, we haven't done DNA fingerprinting, but um, uh, they have what's referred to as mustachio markings, that is muzzle markings that are unique to each animal once they become an adult. Um, when they're juveniles, those markings will change, but as they become adults, uh, they have kind of a fingerprint based on the color morphology of their muzzle. And so if you have really good photography, you're able to document the matriarch. Usually these are kin groups. You can document the matriarch and follow those kin groups. And that usually lasts from anywhere to six months to a year to year and a half. So the two types of North American otter activity is uh, primary activity, which is through observation or secondary activity through animal sign. Um, and in this video, you're seeing a little of both. So this otter is called Patches. Patches is um, rubbing her face and her back hind feet, um, essentially creating a marking. This is a nesting site where they sit above land and they'll just of nap there, a couch. This is uh, called a latrine dance. They are sprinting there. That is a combination of feces and urine and a type of digestive jelly. Here they're rolling around. So you get both primary, which is observation, and secondary, which is animal sign. And this is really valuable. This is through a, an infrared trap camera or trail camera, sometimes called trophy cameras. Um, and so the ways in which I gather data are all through non-invasive measures. Otters are not terrific for using GPS um, uh, collars. They don't work. Their girdle is too small around their uh, clavicle. So it just doesn't, doesn't work well. Also, um, they experience shock really easily. And so um, to minimize that and to protect their overall well-being, um, all of my methods are non-invasive primarily through activity budget budgets using primary observation. This includes photo documentation, scuba sa uh, scan sampling, infrared video documentation, and citizen science reporting. So I have a group of 150 citizen scientists across Island County, that's in Whidbey Island and Camino Island, that um, will send me texts or phone calls or emails or go to my website, um, and they'll report their observations. And this has been incredibly helpful in terms of getting um, reasonable counts of what's going on um, in terms of otter activity. Secondary method uh, is through collection. So I go to latrines or marking stations, um, uh, sometimes through sleep spaces, and I collect hair and scat. Um, and the scat looks like this. Um, it has a kind of musky smell. I think it smells kind of, if it's fresh, like Earl Grey tea. It is not an unpleasant uh, odor. Um, it's not malodorous, I don't think. Um, although if it's in a, in a confined space and it starts to age, it, it becomes markedly fishy. Um, and then this is their digestive jelly. It's thought to act much like we think of um, ambergris in sperm whales. So a kind of digestive mucus that coats um, some of their prey items, particularly those that have sharp spines, and it comes out in the feces and it looks kind of like this snot and has a similar similar consistency, although it's, it's a lot, it would be a lot of snot if that was a mucus ball. But in that, you can get from the feces, uh, diet composition, you'll find parasites and uh, any pathogens, 
hormones can be collected in particular from the, the digestive mucus, DNA from the tissues, and then persistent organopollutants as well. And if you're collecting, you go from, from scat to putting that in a solution of um, biodegradable soap, let it sit overnight, it goes through a sieve, and you end up with this very scientific looking um, series of dried samples. But you can tell the difference in their diet um, each of these is a different sample that ends up going into um, petri dishes and sent to a physical anthropology lab that's responsible for virtually all of the national marine fishery or fish and wildlife studies for diet composition. Um, and they bring some that back to us. So back to that question of what's their principal diet and how does the diet change across seasons? This research is in review. Um, the prey diversity on Whidbey Island was from 190 scat samples from January 2019 through May um, 2021. And um, they predate 54 different species. 11 of them were um, unknown uh, species, but the genus were identified. So there might be gunnel, but not prickle gunnel, or it might be a sculpin, but not staghorn. So we had staghorn, we had buffalo sculpin, we had great sculpin, but then there were some that they just couldn't identify. Um, and so it was unknown sculpin species, and there were 11 of those. And this was from 525 different prey collections. So um, you're going, well, how do you get 525 different prey collections from 190 scat samples It's because there may be a variety of different species within their scat. Um, these came from three, 32 different latrines along 13 bays, ponds, harbors, and lakes with over 50% of their diet uh, consisting of demersal fish. These are fish that live on the bottom. They're benthic fish. They're usually thought of among fisher people as um, trash fish or bait fish. If we look at preferred prey species um, among all of those, uh, you can see here the three-spined stickleback, the buffalo sculpin, um, starry flounder, this represents staghorn sculpin as well. Um, these are the, the most preferred. So a number of these aren't labeled just because they're a much smaller percentage. So the greatest percentage are these demersal, largely demersal fish. So um, uh, I'm not going to show this because I'm afraid we'll run out of time. But um, in terms of how they're optimizing their forage strategy relative to seasons, here you uh, can see essentially um, fall, winter, spring, and summer, with fall being green and winter being sort of this bright chartreuse color. Um, the bulk of the fish, regardless of season, are marine fish whereas um, estuarine fish uh, take up the second sort of um, largest category with freshwater fish representing a smaller category. Amphibian uh, mammals and birds fall into here too. Notice that they occur predominantly in the winter here. This is because wave action is much greater in the winter, making it difficult for them to forage in the marine environment. And so you'll see them more in freshwater or terrestrial environments. Um, storms often as well prevent them from foraging in a coastal environment. Also the amphibians overlaps in the spring. These were tadpoles. So they will capitalize on tadpole. Um, uh, hatching, and then also crustaceans in the summer as well. Um, relative to their activity based on time of day. So consistent with being this uh, crepuscular animal, you see the bulk of their activity here in the bay versus in a lake um, occurring predominantly in dawn and morning. Dawn meaning from around 4.30 to 6.30, morning from um, around seven o'clock to 10 o'clock um, and you have dusk right at sunset. Um, and then also more likely to be in the bay during low tide. This makes sense because um, our demersal fish are a tidal migrants. So at high tide, they're most active. So at low tide, they're less active. And you don't want to be uh, expressing or expending a lot of energy as a marine forager. So you're going to go out at low tide 
when your target population is least active, that is they're hanging out on the bottom, they're not out in the water column foraging. And if you've ever gone diving with sculpin or flatfish, um, you can practically go up and touch them and grab them. Um, River otters, interestingly, if you think of also just the remarkable adaptation, they'll go from fresh water immediately into salt water. They've managed to adjust their buoyancy. They're adjusting for changes in uh, visibility in the water column. They don't have special um, uh, uh, structures for seeing underwater. So much of what they're doing is sensing with their vibris ray, their whiskers on the benthic surface. So they're feeling around for microcurrents um, in the benthic area. So feeling around at the at the um, uh, bottom of the of the ocean there. And then also relative to when they were most frequently in the bay, it was during slack tides, it was when current speed was at its lowest, also when wind speed was at its lowest and when there was a calmer sea state. So using Beaufort sea scale as a um, moderator. Uh, relative to the comparative analyses, so these um, data are in review through Northwest Naturalist. Um, the comparative analyses are at the Oregon Zoo. So um, we had 51 samples that we collected. This is my research assistant. She is an undergraduate, now postgraduate student um, at Pacific University. She came with me in May to Whidbey and we collected, this is her collecting um, a jelly sample. We took to the wildlife endocrine lab at the Oregon Zoo where they're doing um, the glucocorticoid analysis, in fact, fecal uh, glucocorticoid metabolite analyses and comparing it with um, the river otters at the zoo to look at um, differences between the two. And what that will provide is um, meaningful information relative to existing enrichment, social and behavioral protocols at the Oregon Zoo. If we see um, higher levels of um, glucocorticoids in the captive population relative to the native population, um, what does that mean in terms of do we adjust protocols for those animals? Should we look at it relative to parenting? Should we look at it relative to injury? Um, and so these are some of the ways that this may inform how to better serve the existing animals at the zoo. Um, other studies at, uh, that I'm looking at with Island County, these are pending grant funding. Um, this is looking at genetic fingerprinting to look at pedigrees. What is the interrelatedness of the population of otters um, on Whidbey Island? Um, also, uh, what's their distribution relative to genetic diversity? And then also looking at trapped pollutants or contaminants. So um, again, looking at some of the salvage among all of those salvage, except for the pup where it was too badly decomposed. Um, I have liver samples and will essentially look at what the persistent organopollutants are um, relative to our, our population there. There is um, two naval uh, uh, Air Force bases on Whidbey Island that have um, had to remediate brominated flame retardants that got into the water column at various times in the last five years. And so there is a concern about um, some of the wildlife in the, in the watershed. And so that is one of the things that um, I'll be looking at. And if we look at this relative to um, research in informing the reintroduction of Oregon sea otters, um, this is how I often come upon otters is through salvage. This is a colleague, a professor at um, Pacific University in Ecology, her daughter, Karina. Um, they were May 31st of this year at Waldport on the Oregon coast, and they stumbled upon a sea otter carcass. It was immediately, um, uh, they immediately notified Fish and Wildlife and uh, the Marine uh, Mammal Stranding Network, and I believe they took care of it, um, collected it for necropsy shortly thereafter. But this is how I often come upon um, uh, salvage on the Oregon coast. 
uh, or excuse me, on the uh, Washington coast. Um, and it's through sharing information on causes of disease or causes of death or pathogens in both wild and captive populations that better inform those who seek to conserve, preserve, and support um, these delicate species. So uh, understanding a little bit about um, river otters that share waterways with our sea otters uh, can only help in informing the overall health of the watershed and of um, plans for reintroduction. So just a quick recognition to those community members that, that are involved, the citizen scientists that I talked about before. These are some from this year who have done uh, some of the reporting. And if there are any questions, I'll stop sharing and um, happy to take those. Was super fascinating. I loved it. Thank you. All right, we do have one question so far. Um, do we have any information on if and how river otters in Oregon or Washington cope with wildfires? Great question. That is a great question. I have no information on that. Um, that's a great question. Um, Chanel, if you would get their email, I will look into that because I that that's a great question. I have no idea. That's a stumper right off the bat. <laughs> um, okay, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q and A feature. I know we're almost at seven o'clock, so if you have to um, leave us, we'll be sad to see you go. Um, but if you have any more questions, please feel free. Uh, I have a question. Was there anything in the diet of the river otters that was surprising or unique or just like a totally random, like where the heck did they get that from? So um, I was surprised at how often they um, preyed on birds. Um, they, and in fact, I watched them take down a surf scoter, which is not a small bird. Um, they, uh, they regularly sort of did a lion weight with ducks. So surf scoter is a type of duck, it's a marine duck. Um, I watched them take down ducklings, um, uh, buffle heads. So I was surprised at that. Um, there have been other studies both in Vancouver, BC, as well as in the San Juans looking at diet. Um, they're almost always a little different. So in the San Juans, about 25% of the river otters um, that were coastal foraging were um, preying on rockfish, and one of them was an endangered rockfish. So there was a concern. There was a concern um, that they were serving as um, a, a, a hindrance to the recovery of that particular fish. And I didn't see that at all among my data. Also, there was a concern among salmon. Um, you'll note in my little graph that. Um, there were there was one salmon that had been caught, um, but I'm pretty sure it occurred. Uh, it overlapped. There's a unfortunately when you're looking at your statistics, sometimes there is qualitative information that you have that isn't that you have to use to inform your quantitative. It was one sample among all of those. It occurred during um, uh, salmon fishing season. And it was in an area where there were a lot of um, fish parts from fish who were from fishermen who were filleting. And so, um, given that, uh, I don't think that that actually was a preyed upon. I think it was an opportunistic salvage of, from the otter, um, and that was a con that has been a concern across Puget Sound because of the salmon fishery, and also because the salmon are such an important fish for uh, the southern resident uh, killer whales. And so, um, are they competing with river otters who have a voracious appetite that have a transit time of about 45 minutes from ingestion to, ex to expulsion? Um, and so that, that was a real concern and that was not in my sample. Super. Um, Patricia, along those lines, uh, was asking, I thought your seasonal data for birds was mostly spring, which would indicate immature or nesting prey? Yeah, 
That's right. Uh, and in particular, the video that I wanted to show, but I knew I wasn't going to have time, was um, a river otter hunting and catching a mallard duckling. Um, the uh, it's it's cute. If we have, I mean, it's not cute, but it's kind of cute. Um, <laughs> depending on what, what perspective you take. Uh, the um, surf scoter was on Christmas Eve. So um, they predominantly take them in the spring, but uh, that doesn't mean that they won't do it in, in winter too. It's uh, considerably harder. They have to drown the fish in, or excuse me, the birds um, in the marine environment if they're gonna take the, an adult bird. Wow. All right, uh, Emma has a question. Do you have any information on the, how big the population of river otters is in the Columbia Slough in Portland? They've seen about four in the last five years. Yeah, so um, that is my old stomping ground. In fact, part of my interest in river otters as a target population, I was a floater. I lived on a floating home. Um, on Bridgeton, which is just right by Delta Park, right off of I-5. And periodically I would see them. In fact, I have a great video of my dogs and two river otters interacting. Um, I have some um, specimens specifically collected from Bridgeton. They're all crustaceans. Um, but I don't know, I don't know the population density because generally the river otters are not permanent residents along that the slough there that you're referring to, where the floating home communities are. Um, they are in particular because the current is super strong. Um, they are usually traveling through that area where you might see more permanent. Um, or, or more frequent flyers of the area is by where the Sea Scout base used to be. I think the Sea Scouts have disbanded, but um, where the Sea Scout base used to be right across from the airport. Um, they had more regular um, river otter activities there. But for the most part, the amount of observations, and this is anecdotal based on my experience, is I'd see maybe one a year. Um, and so that implies that you're seeing sort of transient animals moving as part of their range. This is riparian otters. So remember that their range can be upwards of 100 kilometers. Wow. Uh, Maria asked a great question. Did you find any plastic in their stomachs? Uh, that's a great question. I did not. I only had four animals. Um, so I did not find plastic in their um, stomachs. Um, for the most part, the otters are um, hunting, so they are um, not uh, eating things that are that are already decomposed or eating trash or rubbish. Um, so I did not find in those four any plastics, but I can tell you that that became a hobby of mine in, in doing uh, the coastal observations was picking up the litter. And I had an undergraduate student come with me one year, specifically she was an environmental science student um, whose entire project was looking at the diversity of marine plastic. And um, just for, for giggles, um, her top five things were um, plastic, tampon applicators. Plastic tampon applicators were one of the most common things that she found. Um, second were uh, shotgun shells. Um, the third, I had to have someone explain to me what the heck it was. They're plastic canisters that apparently hold um, joints. So at dispensaries, they sell um, joints and they come in individual plastic canisters and whether those washed ashore or people were going to the beach to have a good high uh, <laughs> from the dispensary I don't know um, but uh, that was one of the third and of course water bottles and then mylar balloons so balloons from uh, people's you know birthday parties and there's some of the things that you you know you would expect, but um, I didn't think that they would be the most common. There's lots of microplastic and things that you couldn't identify. There's just like a random piece of plastic. Um, of course, also there's styrofoam. So whether or not we want to call that plastic or not, um, styrofoam from uh, particularly from hulls of boats and also from um, 
derelict docks were really common. But in terms of the plastic, those were the top five um, that she found, but not, not in the stomachs of the five that I ate, I'm happy to, or that I, that I, that I salvaged, not in the stomachs of the five uh, or the four that I um, salvaged, I'm happy to report. So my guess is that um, another follow-up to that was that there wasn't any plastic in their scat either. Mm -mm. Nope. Great. Okay, we have a couple more questions rolling in. Thanks for those who are still here watching us. Um, Emma asks, you mentioned river otters eat tadpoles. Have you seen them eat bullfrog tadpoles? Um, the frogs that they are eating in on Whidbey Island is in a really small pond. It's called Green Bank Farm. It's a tiny little man-made pond. It's a, um, a farm co-op. And there's a little restaurant there and you could actually watch this one otter for two years had exploited this pond. Um, and I think that they are Pacific frogs. So they're, they're not a bullfrog. Um, they're just sort of common Pacific green frog um, uh, that, that the tadpoles were, were of. And so that, that is the species specific to that particular prey item. And it was one specific area. They do not make great um, specimens for scat because there's virtually nothing there uh, when you when you go to clean the feces. So um, fortunately, Pacific identifications is it's great. They're a great um, lab, and they were able to still identify it, but not bullfrog. All right, noted. Uh, Courtney asks, do you have any information about how often fostering occurs in the wild? If so, are there any differences in pop concentrations in pups due to possible differences in tran or lactational transfer? Sorry. Yeah, so um, alloparenting occurs in um, siblings. So uh, river otters, um, wean at about three months. They stay with mom for six months if, if they're male, if they're female. But at six months, the guys are kicked out. Um, they become typically too competitive for food. And so they are um, uh, kicked out of the kin group. And the females will frequently stay for another few months. Sometimes for those that um, were in Admiralty Bay, there were kin groups that were two years old. And mom would go into another season. Um, the, the females, uh, her, her offspring from the previous season did not, two of them did not reproduce. They didn't leave. Um, and so they actually became alloparents for her next litter. So it does happen. Um, in terms of frequency of that um, standby, I can tell you relative to Whidbey exclusively, this is, how, this is how river otter work is because they're so different based on geographic area. If you look at any of the work by Blundell or um, Marav Ben David, uh, Marav Ben David does research in Wyoming and in Alaska, those two populations and her reports will be different. Um, Blundell and their research in the Puget Sound area will be different from even where I am in Whidbey Island, which is still Puget Sound as part of Salish Sea. So um, we, don't, we don't have a nice general thing because they are such specific, um, adaptive, flexible animals in terms of their foraging and social behavior. All right, I think that's all our questions. Do you have any closing comments or remarks or if people want to get in contact with you to ask more exciting questions? How do yeah, do my, um, I'll put my website in. Um, and then my email is just island at pacificu.edu. You're welcome to go to either place. My website will has a place for sending emails or questions. Um, but also you can just send me an email directly. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for you if you if you have them um, or look them up and follow up with you because I, I am curious about the wildfire 
question. Um, I don't, I would be very surprised if I find much on that. <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks for all of you 19 that are still here. Um, have a great evening and stay tuned for um, an exciting announcement in the middle of August from us. I can't say too much about it yet, but we have an exciting partnership coming up. And then our feasibility study will be published on our website at the end of August. So I know everybody's been very uh, patient waiting for that. So you can learn all the things about possible sea otter reintroduction in Oregon. So have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Bye.